sponsored by the Degama Group. Welcome to Rumbo Minero. My name is Jorge Leon Benavides. And together with Cesar Campos, we are going to develop this program. Cesar, how are you? What a pleasure, Jorge, as always. We have some uh, important news this week that you wanted to comment on, right? Yes, about this acquisition uh, stock market, by the way, of the Luxic Group, very powerful in the mining sector, exactly in Chile. neighboring Chile. They have Antofagasta Minerals. They have acquired no less than 19% of shares uh, of Buenaventura, which, uh, according to the perspective of many analysts, would strengthen the projects and especially the geological initiatives that Buenaventura has in its portfolio uh, for the development of copper. Right. Many have highlighted. Hopefully we have to have a large part an important partner right? in addition to globalizing. And this is an issue that you are very interested in the participation of suppliers in the international market. That is to say, with a partnership of this nature or a participation, let's say, of 19 percent, nothing less than gives you the right to, I don't know, if one or two seats on Buenaventura's board of directors. I believe that this strengthens the idea that these projects, hopefully Buenaventura has in its portfolio totally to move agree, forward, totally right? Agree. An interesting piece of news that we are going to... There is also the issue of investment in Peru. Because exactly. they are betting on a mining company, very important in Peru, but Chilean capitals are betting on a company, right? That's very true. Well, too. we are going to have Congressman Anderson as our guest. We're going to talk about the role of Congress in relation to mining. There's a lot of bread to be sliced there. We're going to look at what Congress has done and what we can demand of Congress with respect to mining. We will talk about everything, even rainfall, right? Of course it is. Who else are we going to have? And Carlos Anderson will answer absolutely all the issues that we are going to raise. We will also have the presence of the engineer Jorge Luis Cardenas. He is Dynacor's vice president of operations, and we will discuss the important topic of responsible gold with shared value. That's right. Below we are going to see and uh, listen to the main mining news of the week by Gabriela Chicoma. Thank you, Jorge. These are the main mining news of the week. In a surprise decision, the Panamanian government has rejected Orla Mining's request to extend concessions on three key mining projects, a move that not only directly affects the Canadian company, but also sends shockwaves through the mining sector in the region. The Lata Hospital, built by COSAPI and financed by the mining company Antamina under the Works for Taxes modality, commissioned by the Ministry of Health, continues to progress at the planned pace and is in its final stage on the verge of being handed over. The modern infrastructure, a second level of care, will benefit more than 470 people in the district of Lata in the province of Huamalies, Huanuco. The Chilean company Antofagasta, part of the Luxic Business Group, announced that it has acquired a 19% stake in Compañía de Minas Buenaventura SAA through a subsidiary. In a transaction in line with its strategy of prioritizing investments in the Americas, Buenaventura is a Peruvian precious metals producer with experience in exploration, development, construction, and operation of mines. Uh, well, we are now joined by the Congressman of the Republic, Carlos Anderson. Let's talk a little bit about mining and Congress. Congressman, welcome to Rumbo Minero. How are you? Good morning. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, you have presented a motion of interpolation to the Minister of Economy, Alex Contreras, although this should still be seen in March, obviously because of the deadlines, right, of next year, the next legislature. What are the reasons that lead you to this and what changes will have to take place beyond that? Some people, including me, think that is... Oh, do you think rather said... Do you think that it is really the person or that the factors that we have discussed, external, internal, are bad? It's a combination of things. Of course, look, first, some data that I think could explain. The world, the world on average, global GDP, is growing at 3%. In other words, the world is not in crisis, ah, one. Two, uh, Latin America, according to ECLAC, is growing at an average of 2.2% this year. There are countries like the Dominican Republic, this one, Costa Rica, eh, Panama, 
that are growing between 5 and 6.5%, yes, Peru is going to decrease minus 0.6%. If it had been one of the stars, we became the worst in the class. In other words, not on the international side. No, not on the international side. There is a management issue here. This is a mostly, mostly self-inflicted crisis because mineral prices, for example, are still there, aren't they? This. But how much has it affected, for example, that Castillo has recently been in uh, as president? I'm sorry, what do you mean, recently? One year ago, one year ago, one, two, this one, Mr. Contreras, was vice minister of economy during all the months of Mr. Castillo and then minister. In other words, he is a key player in the economic policy of the last two and a half years. Rather, the question is, why have we not questioned him before? And why has it been so difficult for me, for example, to get 2020 signatures to be able to question him? And that has to do with the conspiracy that exists nowadays between the Congress and the executive, right? Because, of course, the executive has no further support of any kind. And it has, let's say, given in, I think, to the pressures, to the support for a reason, right? You give me, I give you, what do I know with the majority parties in Congress? Now, if all this were for the good, if this were part of, let's say, an understanding, we are going to improve the country. We are going to, for example, write this, to face illegal mining, informal mining, we are going to put, in other words, are we going to do things for the country? I would say, perfect, that's great, but it is not the case. It is simply the private interest of each one, isn't it? And this, then the government pretends to govern and the Congress pretends to control, but neither of the two things no, and the isolation of the Minister of Economy, Alex Contreras, from reality is pathetic. What he says to the Cade to point out that there is an absurd pessimism, as if it were an emotional reaction of all Peruvians that the economy is not working. Yeah, or like fighting deception. with the Fiscal Council, for example, for the advance of profits from the Banco but, de la Nación. But, but, but of course, I don't know who you are trying to fool. Look, yesterday I was in a, in a call conference, call video conference, for example, with Standard & Poor's analysts, right? This one, they... As they say, as they say in Creole, they don't suck their thumbs. Of course they know. There is even a name for that. Look, in English it is called short, short in the box. It is a practice, isn't it? It is a shenanigan, this accountant, super well known, that nobody respects, right? So a country like ours, that during 20 years of good macroeconomic policy management, right, it gained, let's say, this international respect, suddenly starts to lose it because it says how, it already looks like any other little country. Carlos, but quickly, a eh, Ponche Peru, it's versions 1, 2, and now Plan Unidos. So I wanted an explanation from you to tell us why has it failed. Because, because look, very simple. You see, because there has been a wrong diagnosis, 1 and 2, because the answer was put in the wrong place. Let me explain. E, when Mr. Contreras recently presented Con Ponche Peru, I observed one thing. 60% of the public investment was allocated to local governments and regional governments. For the first year of government of these governments, of these local and regional governments, the historical experience in Peru shows that in the first year, local and regional governments never invest even 30% of what they are given. And we have regional governments that have invested more than 5%, 10%, right? So how are you going to give a signal to private investment? Because that's what finally, public investment is. It is a signal. It's 20% of the total investment, right? And you go, you entrust it to someone you know perfectly well in advance that they are not going to do it. That is what happened. Then, private investment, on the other hand, says, well, hey, but if they are not promoting this, they are not spending for that, why am I going to, why am I going to invest? No, if it's not going to revive demand or anything like that. Bonds are it is well known, isn't it? Even from the economic literature, aren't they? They are known as one-off. That is to say, it has an immediate effect and it is immediately undone. It is immediately undone, right? Instead of having launched, launched for example, a national plan of, of reconstruction or construction of roads, sidewalks, retaining walls. In More other words, are the explanations, eh, that do not convince anyone than the works? Yes, than of the course. one that the... There is no credibility. And the issue of the Fiscal Council, for example, has already been a scandal, hasn't it? To pretend and moreover to bother with the Fiscal Council where there are three respected former ministers of economy. I may have my disagreement, but they are very respectable professional people. And what they point out is a truism. How can we anticipate profits that we do not even know if they are going to materialize or not? Well, these are arguments. Forceful. The truth is that what we are hearing about the minister of economy are convincing arguments. Let's move on to mining. We are in Rumbo Minero, although economic issues are always very important. 
what would you recommend or what should the government have done with the Patas massacre, which is not the first time this year, it is the second time something has happened at Minera Poderosa. With respect to mining, we already know, we have talked about it before. There is mining that does want to be formalized and mining that will never be formalized and which apparently even leads to murders. What should the government have done immediately before giving a condolence? Which is what, well, what they... Before, first of all, I want to, uh, once I saw someone ask him, hey, how can you stop Messi, right? And one said, you have to anticipate Messi. What does it mean to anticipate? You have to prevent him from leaving the hotel. It is the same here, isn't it? You have to anticipate these events. There was, look, I have just received a concerned visit from the company's authorities, right? Saying to me, Carlos, look, this is happening. I say, have you talked to the Ministry of the Interior? Yes, we have. Have you talked to the general? Yes, they have talked to everybody. The situation was super well known. So this cannot have been a surprise for, for the government. But in general, if you allow me to extend it, look, Peru today is being harassed by the economy's criminals. This is a criminal economy. This, uh, the super organized crime. Look, the only thing we are missing is that we start to see what is called city takeovers, which is also a criminal practice where there is a consortium of different gangs and they really go and liberate in Quartation Marx and Aria. What happens, for example, in Patas, it is very clear there, isn't it? It is not one gang, it is several gangs. So here Peru has to understand the magnitude of the challenge, the magnitude of what this attack on Peruvian society means. It is not only against the company Poderosa, it is not only against the region, it is not only against the gold mining activity, it is against the country. These are Peru's enemies, exactly like the terrorism that we faced before. Here there is a different terrorism, a criminal terrorism, an urban terrorism. In addition, sorry, sorry, Congressman, but I would also add how dangerous it is because in some cases there has been talk that there, the miners, a illegal aliens who do not want to become formalized, these criminals, East are subsidizing political campaigns. Well, of course, if you were to ask me, which you have not asked me, what, for example, has this Congress done for mining? I would tell you it has done a lot for one type of mining, which is illegal mining or informal mining. And on the other hand, it has ignored and continues to ignore that in Peru there is world-class mining, right? That the only thing he wants is, hey, let me work, right? Now, I also have my criticisms of mining, even formal mining, don't I? Because I always demand the best because I know a little about how it works in Australia, in Canada, etc. But compared to, let's say, to what happens with illegal informal mining, it is absolutely nothing, isn't it? We have little time left, Carlos. I wanted to ask you about a current issue. Did you know that the president of the Congress was going to suspend the legislature? I'm asking you this because the opinion of the Committee of Economy to uh, maintain the extension or to extend the tax exemption on profits from stock exchange transactions is to be submitted to the plenary session. And you request in plenary in the middle of the meeting in the hemicycle that this be previously consulted as it should be. No, but no, it, it, there has been a mistake there. Look, Mr. Aldo Mariategui, misinformed and with a bad temper, has said that I am, let's say, responsible for the fact that it has not been the, the, this... Uh, and he also points out his Susel Paridis just in case. No, no, yes, also, also. But let me mention it a little bit. I Look, in my life, I have talked for more than two minutes with Susel Paridis. In my life, huh? So imagine if I start plotting, well, that's something else, isn't it? That's perfect. But you asked, did you or did you not ask no, for no. this? No, no, but we must clarify things. First, there was a meeting in the Economy Commission several days before the plenary session. And in the Economy Committee, I said two things. First, that it was very important to stimulate the capital markets and that an instrument in an emerging economy is precisely the exemption of capital gains. That is normal, isn't it? Evidently, in Peru, we have already had it for 10 years, right? We have to look for this, for it to have results, don't we? In other words, you were basically in favor of the extension. In favor. Well, so much in favor, so much in favor, that in the economics committee, even though I pointed out that there was no uh, favorable opinion from the MEF, which would be good to have, right? I voted in favor, even without the document, in the economics committee. And in the plenary, I voted in favor again. What happens is that when, when I asked, I say, but it is not yet, this, the MEF report, right? The president said, well, the MEF says it is in agreement. I mean, excuse me, but you can't handle it like that. This is an issue of high formality, isn't it? No, we are requesting it. He says they are going to send it. I mean, well, as long as he complies, and it is not like the case, isn't it, of this whole uh, project, let's say, of pension reform, where the minister has promised almost three months ago 
that he is going to send the current study, and so far, nothing. On the day of the plenary session, that is two days later, in the plenary session, just before the vote was taken, the letter from the positive MF appeared on the platform, didn't it? So then, the chairman of the Committee on Economy should have said, well, I would like to inform the plenary that this letter has arrived, right? Etc., etc. Perfect, it didn't, and in spite of that, in spite of that, right? Now you can verify, I voted in favor. I mean, how could I have been against? Also, Aldo, I thank you if you are watching me, right? That you attribute so much power to me, but I am only one vote. Very well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for being with us, and we are left with the phrase uh, that the Congress did a lot for illegal mining and nothing for formal mining. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much to you. Okay, Gabri, now we move on to Gabriela Chicoma's announcement about Expomina. Go ahead, Gabriela. Thank you very much. Expomina Peru, the largest and most important mining event of the year 2024, with 16 years of trajectory, with the special participation of the United States as guest mining country. Expomina Peru is the only Peruvian event certified by the United States Department of Commerce. Do not be left out and be part of this great mining event. Reserve your booth at Expomina Peru. For more information, visit our website, www.expominaperu.com. Well, we are now entering the America Mining Block. Of course, we are already connected from New York with our international editor of Rumbo Magazine. Our international editor of Rumbo Minero Magazine, Jose Gonzalez, to talk about various things, uh, as always, very, uh, various things, as always, very interesting in the international arena. Jose, how are you? Uh, very good, Jorge. Always happy to be in the program. Jose, uh, speaking a little about the consolidation of lithium uh, after 14 years of projects, eh? Bolivia inaugurates its first industrial scale lithium plant. And so Quimish announces an alliance with Hancock to acquire sulfur ore in Australia. Tell us a little bit about what's going on with what's what's being announced in the lithium markets in terms of these events that seem to circumvent the more than 80% drop in the price this year. What's going on with lithium? Many people ask and ask about both. Uh, copper and lithium, right? But lithium, I don't know, no. I have the feeling that we don't see it advancing to the levels of copper. That is correct, Jorge. After precisely those 14 years, Bolivia, the country with the largest lithium reserves in the world, has inaugurated its first lithium production plant with Chinese capital. According to Bloomberg, however, Bolivia's road to lithium will be a long one. The plant, with a cost of $100 million, is capable of producing up to 15,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year but it will only be operating at one-fifth of its installed capacity in 2024. Bolivian lithium has a high concentration of magnesium, which reduces purity levels and increases refining costs, which in the case of Bolivia are also increased by the absence of export ports. The plant seeks, however, to extract the metal directly. The Bolivian experiment in lithium production is different from the Chilean or Argentinian brines or the lithium in beta that we have in Peru. They are looking to produce it directly to have a reduced environmental impact on the Uyuni salt flats. And the technology, which is new, is what is raising big questions. However, it has an abundance of metal superior to any other reserve on the planet, which has led to the construction of this new refinery uh, which is a strategic partnership between Bolivian Lithium Deposits, which is a state-owned company with KTL of China leading the effort and Brump and CMOC of China joining in. And the country has just signed a new agreement with Russia's Uranium One Group. In the case of Chile, Sokumich announced this week its alliance with Australia's Hancock Prospecting to acquire the firm. A exploration company, Azure Minerals, also from Australia, for $1.1 billion. Sokimich is the largest lithium producer in Chile. It is private, with new regulations since the administration had already established an agreement with Azure, but the alliance with Hancock strengthens the acquisition, which includes a lithium project in Australia called Andover in the, in the Pilbara region. According to Sokimich, this merger for capital and scope strengthens the project development capacity of both companies. Both announcements imply, Jorge, 
precisely what you point out. Lithium has fallen on chain more than 80% in the year 2023. However, demand is expected to increase sixfold in the next few years. To the extent that we have not yet seen the replenishment of the electric car fleet in Europe and in the United States, United States and these consolidations, one, the launching of Bolivia and the interest in Bolivian lithium production and the consolidation of Australian lithium explorers and producers. And Chileans uh, is another indication that there is a consolidation in the market as a function of, uh, of what's to come. Eh? And you have to, to underline always the agreements. The results of COP28 make the decarbonization process no longer stagnant and more or less inevitable. Uh, you say, on the other hand, this week in the Congo, uh, an African country, a former Belgian colony, presidential elections took place. Congo is something very important for us because a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, it was reported that it was competing with Peru for the second place in copper production at the uh, global level. Uh, how should we focus our interest in these uh, presidential elections taking place in this country? Precisely, Cesar, why are we interested in the Congo when we are in Africa? One, why and why is the world interested in it? Because of, the, because of the importance of the country's mineral resources, even more so when the situation in the Congo in the Congo is extremely complex. Speaking of complexities in Peru, we tend to emphasize not our problems, but our promises and possibilities. And the interest in the Congo in the Congo happens precisely and particularly in this presidential election because of the challenges that a mining country represents. To have the perspective of Congo, it is necessary to understand that President Felix Tisekedi, the favorite for re-election, presides over a country the size of Western Europe, mired in decades of crisis and civil war, and in which 44 million people vote. That is 100 million inhabitants having to choose between 25 candidates for the presidency and 100,000 candidates for various public offices. According to The Economist, 70% of voter identification cards are illegible. And in the election, in an election where vote counting materials did not reach all parts of the country and where 7 million voters out of 44 million live in the east of the country and have been displaced by a civil war, which involves Rwandan support for the rebels and could trigger a war between the two countries. Despite its mineral resources, Congo has 60% of the population subsisting on less than $2.15 a day and a food inflation rate of 173%. Congo accounts for 70% of the uh, global production of cobalt, which is essential for batteries. And as we pointed out, it is the second or third largest producer of copper, depending on how you measure it. In other words, the circumstance and situation of the Congo, the Congo underlines what we pointed out in Peru mining business. Peru and its copper mining conditions are extraordinary compared to countries like Congo, which compete with our copper mining production. Thank you very much, Jose, for the information the A that we will surely have in our magazine, Rumbo Minero. Thank you very much. You already know, e at www.rumbominero.com. You can access the magazine Rumbo Minero. Every 45 days, a new magazine for with all the international and national mining information. Uh, with your space, of course, America Mining. Uh, Cesar. Yes, Jorge. It is time to present the segment of the Institute of Mining Engineers of Peru. The International Congress of Prospectors and Explorers, ProExplo, is the second most important mining event in the country and the most relevant in terms of exploration and geology in Latin America. The importance of exploration lies in the fundamental role it plays in the discovery and establishment of new mining projects. For this reason, ProExplo is a mandatory meeting for companies and professionals working in the sector. In its most recent edition, more than 3,000 people participated physically and virtually, and its 14th edition is expected to be held in 2025, according to its president, Walter Tejada. We look forward to seeing you at ProExplo 2025. 
the international level, the Peruvian Institute of Mining Engineers has continued its role of disseminating the country's mining potential in various international forums, such as the Society for Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, and the World Mining Congress. In addition, since 2019, we were incorporated as members of the International Council on Mining and Metals and hosted the 100th meeting of the International Organizing Committee of the World Mining Congress. Currently, we are preparing to host the 27th edition of the World Mining Congress to be held in our country in 2026. Perumin is the leading mining convention in Latin America and the world, bringing together the most prominent leaders in the global mining sector. Government representatives, investors, researchers, and many professionals linked to this industry. For 70 years, our institute has been organizing this great event, where the challenges and opportunities of mining are analyzed. In its last edition, Perumin 36, brought together more than 65,000 visitors from 56 countries and 23 regions of Peru, making Arequipa the world mining capital. The next edition of the Mining Convention will be chaired by Jimena Sologuren. We look forward to seeing you at Perumin 37. Well, as we had announced, we now meet with engineer Jorge Luis Cardenas, VP of operations at DINACOR. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the topic of responsible gold with shared value. Welcome, uh, engineer Im Cardenas. How are you? Hey, how are you? Thank you very much for your invitation. We are here to talk. Tell us a little bit about it. Hey, DynaCor is a mining company with a successful business model, which is basically to process the gold ore purchased from artisanal miners and small scale mining. Tell us a little bit about the work you do in these mining groups. Uh, because we are in a very complicated time with the rainfall issue, with the issue of misused rainfall with much charge against artisanal uh, informal mining. The truth is that there is a lot of disorder. How have you managed to put things in order? Tell us a little bit about this. Okay, this well, Dynacor is a Canadian mining company that has been operating in Peru. This for 27 years. Uh, the Peruvian subsidiary is called Minera Veta Dorada and uh, since always, since then we have this, our business has consisted in the production of gold through the processing of minerals that we effectively acquire from small mining producers and artisanal miners in the country, uh, whether they are formal, whether they are formalized, that is to say, those that have those that have successfully completed the formalization process or those that are in the process of formalization. So uh, uh, we have a model, we have effectively created during that time a know-how uh, because we know very well this sector of small-scale artisanal mining. There are 26, almost three decades of experience, and that has allowed us, I repeat, uh, to have a know-how to be able to know this sector and to be able to relate with them. It has been such a successful model that we have been invited by other countries, Africa, for example, so that we can replicate this model there. Why? Because those governments uh, clearly understand, today they clearly understand that one of the ways to formalize the informal miners in those countries is through companies like ours that are dedicated to, that have that type of business, that is the processing of minerals, that service, to be part of that productive chain. Because mining is not only the extraction of minerals, it is also the processing and commercialization of the gold that is finally produced. We agree on that, but the case of you is, it's like a medium-sized island, right? That are successful. What, what would you recommend? Because you know, you are seeing what is happening nowadays, aren't you? We have a lot of problems of not reaching an agreement between a, the informal miners who want to legalize and can't for A or B reasons. 
and the government and the governments, because it is not just one government, but several governments that do not manage to reach a communication. What recommendation would you have rather than recommending governments like Africa, governments like Peru, what, what is lacking? Okay, let me see. First of all, it is important, since you have already touched on the subject, that differentiation. There is a very particular situation at the moment, and indeed there is quite a lot of confusion, quite a lot of uh, ignorance. And one of the things I would recommend in general is that uh, we have to be serious in our analysis. I mean, those of us who work in formal mining companies, we have to be serious, we have to be responsible in our comments, considered in our opinions. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean that illegal mining is different from mining in the process of formalization. In Peru, mining in the process of formalization is known as informal mining, but they are miners who are in the process of formalization. Now, having said that, uh, informal mining is obviously an illegal economic activity. It has to be treated like any other illegal economic activity in the country, whether it is drug trafficking or smuggling, for example. That is, these activities have to be pursued, have to be fought, and have to be eradicated. Now, with respect to miners who are in the process of formalization, there is currently an exceptional formalization process known as REINFO, for the acronym of the registry, a comprehensive mining training registry. Uh, this one, this one, who are the ones who are here? These miners, it is important to know that they are not only miners who have declared their willingness to formalize, not only in that, but at the moment of registering, for example, they have left tax informality. Why? Because at the moment of registration, they have to say, I am, this is my name and surname, I live here, I work here, I need my rock, I want my single taxpayer registry, and what does that mean? That from that moment on, that miner has to declare taxes, has to pay taxes, and not only that, but he is a miner who is subject to inspection uh, by Sunat. So a that is very engineer, important. But Yes, it is extremely important, but the reality appears to be something else. Unfortunately, more than 70% have not complied in completing the formalization process. And this week in the newspaper, Cestion, a very serious statistic was published by an NGO, Cooper Action, which indicates that while 20 million hectares are occupied by formal mining, 25 million hectares are occupied by this sinister combination of illegal, informal and artisanal mining, as you said. So there is not even a vision yet of how to unblock this separation. What would you propose in this respect? Should rainfall continue? Should it be modified? What should be done? We have, look, and to answer your question and to move forward in this discussion, because uh, we have been able to listen and we go around the same thing, right? To move forward yes, to... Because 70% sure. in order to be able to answer everything that Cesar has said is very important. If 70% has not worked, how, what do you propose to and what is happening? It is not only the info because they are also being misused and that is what many authorities are complaining about. Please. Perfect. So, uh, in principle, for example, uh, when we talk about informality in the country, uh, because we are talking about the country, uh, we are not only miners, the country, uh, right? We always talk about the country, so let us talk about the country. Uh, in the country, we know that it is said that 70% of the national economy is informal and 30% is formal. To begin with, uh, why is this information important? Because what it tells us is that we have to reduce this informality which is enormous, 70%. In Ecuador, I think it is 52%. In Colombia, 58%. In Chile, we are talking about 30%, the lowest. In Peru, 70% of the economy. And let's not talk about informal employment, which is 75%. So, what does this mean? That any project, any initiative, any proposal proposed by the state with the aim of reducing this informality should be welcomed and supported. Having said that, today there is a comprehensive mining formalization process. Like any process, nothing is perfect in this life. And this process is perfectible. The point here is that we have to correct what is not working and we have to improve and support what is working. What is okay, not working, for Okay, to understand it, yes, to understand it, to understand it, because we have one minute left and I would like to talk about Dynacore. To understand it then, what you are saying is that the rainfall should continue, but that the issues within the rainfall that are not working well should be fixed so that 70% can have access uh, to finish the process. 
Exactly, indeed. There are about 70,000 that are suspended and 17,500 that are active in force. But what should be done? Several things. One of them, for example, is what the Minister of Energy and Mines mentioned. A purification must be carried out. What for? To separate the wheat from the chaff. Who are those who do not really have the will to continue with the formalization? Who, for example, are those who are spending a lot of time and are doing absolutely nothing? Who are misusing this, this, this process for other purposes? So this, this is an important thing. It is to make a purge. Second, it is only the state that really knows what are the problems that these miners have to formalize. They have the information. Only they have it. So what they have to do is to analyze what is going on. Why? By separating, making this purging, which is necessary, they have to see if there is a way to make them pass to that other group that has advanced. Now, the group that has advanced, those 17,500 miners in formalization, for example, why are they in force? For several reasons. Not only because they have a third category RUC in economics and mining, but also because they have submitted an environmental management instrument, which is the equivalent of an environmental impact instrument. It just appears. And third, because they report their production every six months, as it should be. That but is why they are in force. They start by owning property or permits on the above ground, right? Okay, now, in that group, yes, in that group, you have to move forward, don't you? The question is, what do they need to move forward? What is their problem? The right to surface use of land, what is their problem? The mining concession, right, for example, an exploitation contract, an assignment contract, that is what the state has to promote, improve, support, so that this group of 17,500 at present may swell the ranks of the more than 11,000 that, according to the General Directorate of Mining Formation, have been formalized. Thank you very much for being here. Indeed, thanks to you. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, time we have a mention from uh, Gabriela Chicoma about Expo Mina. Go ahead, Gabi. Thank you very much. Expo Mina Peru from September 11th to 13th, 2024, will be chaired by Luis Rivera, Executive Vice President of Goldfields Las Americas, and integrated by an advisory board of recognized mining leaders who will support us to achieve a magnificent organization. Highlight your brand through the different sponsorships we offer at Expo Mina Peru. Networking opportunities, participation in exclusive activities, promotion in the media, among other important benefits. For more information, visit our website, www.expominaperu.com. Well, coming to the end of the program, Cesar, the subject of... There are precisely two interviewees who differ a lot, right? On the one hand, the issue of this one, what has he done? Congress has done for the government. Well, nothing, as you said. It has rather done for illegal mining. Nothing for formal mining, right? Sad, really sad that they do not realize where a large amount of taxes come from and what needs to be developed more, like other countries that have much larger investments uh, said by the same congressman. Indeed, because it is also necessary to be very direct in this. The national representation no longer has the quality of political representation, but rather represents the interests of the real interests that exist in Peru. Remember that drug trafficking has had uh, what analysts called a narco bank some time ago in the government of President Orlando Humala. Uh, illegal mining is another de facto power that has the presence of defenders within the Congress, as well as illegal logging and the exercise of many activities that are outside the law. In any case, at least the experience that the engineer Jorge Luis Cárdenas Jorge has told us about Dynacor is very interesting because there we have an example, isn't it? We have an example. We are constantly touching on the rainfall issue, but we are learning from this program. I think that, on the other hand, having people with the rainfall in hand saying that they are in the process of and that they can buy uh, dynamite, that they can do a lot of things, giving them carte blanche is wrong. I believe that, yes, the, uh, first of all, I do not know if it is going to be called rainfall, but whatever they have to do, either you are going to formalize or you are not going to formalize. That I am in process cannot take so long and cannot be extended so many times. So I believe that the government also has to come in and carve out the territory, what is not concession, suddenly concession it for spaces, right? But we definitely cannot have people who do not want to legalize with a piece of paper that says they are in the process of legalization, buying dynamite, buying a lot of things, which is dangerous even for the security of the country. We agree. No, well, uh, thank you very much for being with us.
Eh, we thank you, as always, eh, for being with us in Rumbo Minero. Very hot topics that we are going to touch on anyway. Eh, Christmas is coming, Cesar. This one, a eh, Good wishes to all viewers. That's right. A Merry Christmas to everyone, to all of you. And let's hope that this time will be a time of reflection for the whole country with so much fighting and so many problems in the powers that be of the state. And we hope that, we hope it will be a very good year for all of us. Eh, next, don't forget, we come with uh, Peru Construye to talk about construction and infrastructure. My name is Jorge Leon Benavides, and together with Cesar Campos, we have developed this program. In a few minutes, we will meet to talk about construction. <laughs>